Welcome everyone to episode number three of our exploration of Web3 and crypto with myself, Rufus Pollock, and my collaborator, Stephen Deal. Uh, today on this episode, we're going to be diving into the nature of financial products known as securities, their relation to crypto tokens, and the regulatory framework that exists around these structures. Before I begin, we want to just give a little bit of context because this is part of an ongoing in-depth exploration of crypto and Web3. And you can find more about this series at lifeitself.us slash Web3. The context for us is that Web3 has become a massive phenomenon with very bold claims made about its potential impact. Claims that go far beyond classic technology boosterism of better and faster to exciting uh, claims about the radical transformation and improvement of our economic and social systems. At the same time, there is an exceptional lack of agreement about these claims, even on basic points and definitions. And overall, this is one of the most controversial and polarizing topics we've ever seen with strong pro and anti camps. And in particular, disagreement cuts across uh, ideological lines. You can find pro and anti-libertarians and pro and anti-blockchain Marxists. This series is about helping ourselves and others make sense of what is going on to try and reach consensus on the key questions and claims and an overall evaluation of them. And we're starting by exploring particular hopes, aspirations, and the associated ideologies that are driving this area, as well as key concepts. Finally, one point I want to emphasize to people listening is that throughout this series, we're gonna to try to be steel manning the various positions. What that means is we're gonna try and put forward the best version of any given position or thesis, even if it's one we don't think correct. So if you're listening to us and you think, hey, I didn't think they thought that, remember to check, we're trying to set out the best version of any given position. Uh, and we also think this is an approach that the whole space would benefit from. Let's try and imagine the best version of what someone we agree or disagree with is saying, and then examine it critically and open-mindedly. And that's what we're seeking to do in this series. So uh, back to the topic, Stephen, uh, which you're gonna, I think, lead on today in setting out. What's, what is it we're gonna really be looking at today? Yeah, so today we're gonna be diving into the concept of securities, uh, which are a class of financial products that kind of sit at the foundation of most of the kind of modern market economy. Um, and securities are a very kind of jurisdictional thing. They depend on a set of laws and a set of uh, conventions about people agreeing on what is effectively like a collective legal fiction that pools money between people and mediates cash flows between people engaging in commerce according to agreed upon legal framework. Um, and the notion of securities is actually kind of a very old one. It kind of goes back all the way to like the 12th century where like medieval peasants would like buy shares in like common, in the common enterprise of like wheat mills that would grind wheat. And then they'd take a share of the profits or the proceeds from the, the enterprise. Um, and this notion of like joint stock companies is probably one of the first examples of these things throughout history which is like a business entity in which the shares of the company's stock can be bought and sold by shareholders. And each shareholder owns a company stock in proportion, evidenced by their shares. And shareholders are able to transfer their shares to others without any effects to the continued existence of the company. So if you traded things like, you know, Apple stocks, Apple stocks are an example of securities, but things like bonds are also examples of securities. And these are extremely common products in markets today. And they're also one of the areas that has the most, um, extensive kind of legal and precedent framework around it. And so just to, so you just did do that, you gave examples. So people are very familiar with securities in that form that stocks and shares and so on. Um, and what, just to give a sense of why are we talking about this uh, in the context of crypto and Web3? Why are securities relevant just to give us a flavor. I know we're going to talk a lot about that, but just to kind of set us up at the beginning. Yeah, what's the connection? Yeah, so there's a great deal of debate about how crypto investments fall under existing securities regulatory framework. Um, and this is being debated inside the highest offices of our land, inside the courts, um, on the floor of the Senate. Um, 
And the outcome of the final ruling will potentially impact trillions of notional value and potentially like scoff law investments uh, if they're determined to be securities. So, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars basically rests on this kind of legal definition. And so that matters a lot to people who are heavily invested in either the existing securities regulatory framework or in, in the crypto markets today. Got it. Okay. And what is it? I mean, it's kind of obvious, but let's just explain it. Um, it, there's lots of other things which are software that haven't connected with securities law. I mean, you know, like obviously we know that when I, like, if I start a software company or I've done technical work, I might start a company and that's a company, but there's nothing, there's no, there's not any debate or questions about it. Why, why in the case of crypto is securities regulation so relevant? Yeah. So like if you ever started a company before you realize that like, basically you can create stock out of nothing. Basically, you know, you spin up a company and then you issue like, you know, 20 million shares and suddenly poof, like you have this financial product that you've issued basically out of nothing. And what that represents is basically, you know, a share in a common enterprise of a bunch of people that are going to basically do something with the expectation that at some point, um, this enterprise is going to generate cash flow, either from the, sell the sale of its shares or from generating, you know, revenue from selling a product in the market. Um, and so crypto tokens hit up against this because, well, people issue tokens just like they issue shares in companies. Uh, and in some sense, there's a lot of similarities between like the common enterprise of somebody issuing like uh, a token uh, versus issuing equity in a startup. Okay, so let's come back to our explanation. To summarize where we were, there's, there's, there's this modern framework of laws that cover financial products from debt instruments, bonds, equities, and derivatives. And that legal foundation is, is basically on which all of market capitalism is, is built. Now, because of the centrality to markets of those instruments, stocks, bonds, et cetera, they are strictly reg, uh, kind of regulated in a variety of ways. There's, there's strict rules about registration, ownership, and transfer of those things. Is that, that, is that right? That's, that's where we are right now. Now, what's the next point on, on, on this that you want to set out? Yeah, I think it's worth going through um, what the existing kind of regulation looks like, because people who haven't spun up companies before, I think they may not be familiar with some of these terms, right? Um, so if you set up a company in the United States, um, you basically have to register with the SEC. Um, you have to set up an entity that has to basically be regulated like in the sale of its shares. Um, and these laws are, you know, they've been set around since the middle of the, the 20th century. Um, and I think one of the hallmark cases that everybody cites when they first dive into like what are securities is the 1946 ruling, which is SEC versus BJ Hathaway, which defined a very, very legal test known as the Howey test, which basically determines like what a securities contract actually is. And there's four points to this. Um, it's an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the efforts of others, right? So that's a very broad definition. And obviously things like shares fall under that, like shares in a company. Um, but there's also other things that the, the, the test has been applied to throughout history. Um, so things like stocks, obviously, but like animals such as chinchillas uh, can be, or the sale of chinchillas can be classified as a security. Whiskey barrels can be classified as securities. Orange trees in like a grove in Florida can be classified as securities. So it's a very context dependent definition. Uh, that depends on the people selling it, the common enterprise, and the expectation of profits. So obviously, when we start looking at crypto tokens, the real question is, uh, are crypto tokens securities? Because at face value, like obviously people are investing money in these things. Um, most often there's a common enterprise, which is a bunch of developers or promoters of the token that are going off and selling the token to the public. And the public is expecting to you know, see the, you know, Diamond Hands rocket ship go to the moon uh, on the token with the expectation of a profit. Um, and it's derived by the efforts of the promoters of the token and the developers of the network. Um, and so what's really being debated right now uh, is crypto assets, basically securities uh, that kind of have been living outside of the regulatory framework and should they be brought under it? Right, so to summarize this very, uh... That, that securities law is old or the concept of security is old, 
uh, there's obviously a lot of debate about crypto investments falling under this framework because this framework has a bunch of rules and regulations. And when you say, just to explain, you said earlier, you used the term scoffler. What you mean is that many, uh, many crypto uh, well, tokens, et cetera, have not um, sought to comply. Uh, so what you mean by scofflaw is they've kind of gone, hey, we don't need to pay attention to the, the traditional frameworks. This is something new or it's not, it doesn't count as that. We just, we can just issue these things. As we know, people just kind of issue crypto tokens. Tomorrow, they're not registered anywhere. There's no, in theory, uh, binding law, et cetera. And then what you're saying though is, given if we accept the premise that crypto tokens aren't currencies and certainly for many many DAOs that seems clear even we could debate it for bitcoin or something but for many things that seems pretty like they're not currencies mm -hmm. then tokens according to the test you just set out the howey test are clearly investments that may be the expectation of profit mm -hmm. and then the question is are they in that case they'd be unregistered securities is what you're you're saying is that correct yeah that's the thesis and um so crypto tokens at the moment, they kind of currently exist kind of partially outside the kind of U.S. securities framework. Um, so we've seen statements from the SEC, which is the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is the governing body in the United States, which basically registers and relates the sale and transfer of securities, right? Um, and they oversee all the public equities on like the NYSE, the NASDAQ, and basically all the all the markets in the United States, right? So the SEC has made some rather coy statements about uh, crypto tokens. They haven't come out with a broad framework yet, um, but they have taken action against several of these kind of uh, token issuances that have been kind of, they've deemed as scofflaw entities, which are things like initial coin offerings from the kind of 2016 era. If you start selling like debt products on top of securities to the public, or if people are running kind of outright Ponzi schemes, um, built on tokens, then the SEC has generally uh, cherry-picked several, basically, examples of these uh, alleged frauds to basically make an example of. Uh, but it has been a very selective enforcement. Um, so the district courts, uh, which are not the federal courts of the land, but like kind of individual jurisdictions like in New York and California, um, have in many cases ruled that many of these tokens uh, meet the Howey test. Um, and they've consistently indicated that token sales to U.S. persons basically fall under both uh, the Securities Act of uh, the 1930s and the Dodd-Frank criterion of security sales, which are basically the, the legal precedent set up in the United States. Um, so this is important because this matters even if the token sales are done out of a shell company in Switzerland, if you sell securities to U.S. persons, uh, you fall under U.S. securities law. So the U.S. is basically the only kind of country that basically says its laws apply uh, anytime you touch either the dollar or you touch U.S. citizens, no matter where you do this in the world, right? Um, and so this potentially, this definition around whether crypto tokens are securities applies basically globally because the U.S. is willing to use um, you know, its authority to kind of enforce this anytime it touches the dollar or it touches U.S. persons, which is a very broad remit, right? And so what we haven't seen yet is basically a federal case or an executive order from like the president basically setting what the precedent should be. So it's basically in the hands of the courts at the moment. Um, and as we know, the kind of the wheels of justice grind slowly, but they grind fine. And so we're kind of really at an yeah. inflection point where the precedent for the future will be set today. And the success or failure of these projects really depends on what the courts really deem about these things. And uh, at the moment, it's unclear which way they're going to side. And, and I want to deem that, like, let's just emphasize that. So one is, there is already probability because just on a basic look at the Howey test, these things would count as securities. There have been already some decisions in district courts, some selective enforcement by the SEC. There hasn't, however, been any federal uh, kind of case or executive order that sets a national precedent in the US. But can you, the point you say is why this is so crucial is that the success or failure of thousands of blockchain companies and projects, their success or failure rests on token sales not being regulated as securities. And if they are regulated as securities, it's quite possible the entire market, well, there would be a severe impact on the entire market. It might implode. 
can you say a bit more about that? Why do their success? Why do why is it a problem for many projects if they are regulated as securities? Well, the regulation around securities is actually quite um, extensive, right? In order to sell, um, well, first of all, um, to even sell securities, you're limited by what type of product you can sell to the public. And there's types of public securities and there's private securities, right? Um, so when you start at like a private company, um, you're limited by US law to who you can actually sell to. And normally these are classified as what are called accredited investors. So there's a means test under US law that says basically if you create like a company from scratch and start selling shares in a very, very early venture, you can only sell people that are basically institutional, which basically means sophisticated like venture capital funds or private equity or high net worth individuals. Um, and the purpose of this law is basically the fact that high net worth individuals, well, by definition, they have a lot of money. So therefore they can allocate more of their money toward high risk investments. And generally speaking, private um, security sales are generally high risk. If you're investing in, you know, two guys in a garage, right, who want to, you know, change the world, right? Obviously that's a little different than investing in a company like IBM, which has been around for 45 years, right? Um, which has a so lot the, of disclosures the, and makes a lot of disclosures yeah. publicly and so on. Yeah. So the sale of securities really depends who you're selling to and what kind of risk and return are presented in the prospectus. So selling to the general public means that your finances of your company are highly regulated. There's a lot of disclosures. You have to go to like a PwC or a Deloitte and they have to basically audit all of your books and the transparency about uh, the sale of stock by insiders. Because just like we talked about last week, um, non-public information in markets generally tends to produce aberrant behavior. And so like things like insider trading are generally, well, they're prohibited under US securities law. And those are all generally very good things. Um, and so the securities framework as it exists today prevents a lot of fraud. Now, what would happen is if tokens are basically um, sold as basically private securities, um, they would fall under the same framework, which means you could not sell them to the general public. So the public generally likes buying crypto tokens because the barrier to entry is so low. You don't have to be a credit investor. The friction to buying these things is very, very minimal. You can log into an app and just send some money to this, this person and then basically they'll sell you the tokens, right? There's no, there's no regulatory overhead for the most part, um, which is very different than securities where generally speaking for public equities, you have to go through a broker, you have to go through a market maker, the exchange of these things has to go through something called a clearing house and all of these entities along the way have very, very strict controls to kind of minimize conflicts of interest and to prevent fraud. Right. Um, go ahead. You keep, keep going ahead. Yeah. 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 Um, that's generally the framework. So like if crypto tokens were brought under this general framework, um, the low friction and the low barrier to entry would disappear. And for a lot of these things, existing outside of the regulatory framework, the low friction uh, and the possibility of kind of parabolic returns because of aberrant market behavior are part of the features of the asset class. And under a securities framework, a lot of those features would probably disappear or be kind of minimized. Yeah, and just, just to emphasize something here, I think for people uh, and for myself, you can, just to be clear, as a general member of the public, you can invest in companies who they themselves would invest. Your pension fund, is able to invest in startups, in anything it wants, because it's regulated, it has people who are highly expert in theory. There might still be some limitations, by the way, on what pension funds can invest in or other things, but you can always pull it. But the, the protection is that there's both regulation and expertise involved. And what you're almost saying, if I could put it bluntly, is some of the feature of not being regulated securities, you can kind of sell to retail relatively uninformed retail investors uh, it, with completely outside of the framework and all kind of, you know, you can be pumping and dumping your token. You can be, you know, you might, you might not. It might just be as easy for people to invest, but there's a lot of just like wild west as we talked about last week going on. So, and you want you did have what, just to mention, we can think of case 
studies in reality of why this limitation matters. I mean, there's a very famous one recently of obviously Theranos. Uh, do you want to say what happened there? It's just an example, even within the existing system, but how this limitation of investment to high net worth individuals actually protected people in a way. Well, to be fair, there's definitely examples of fraud that happen even within the securities regulatory framework. Yeah. And probably the most prominent example of the last decade was this company, Theranos, which basically built blood testing machines. Um, and as part of like a Wall Street Journal investigation, they discovered that basically the entire company was a fraud. But in the process of that, uh, the company raised $724 million from some of the most private, sophisticated investors on the planet. And this included entities like you know Henry Kissinger, Betsy DeVos, Right. And they invested, because that's what they do with high net worth individuals They allocate a certain amount of their portfolio toward uncorrelated uh, returns in sort of high risk early ventures, right? And, you know, it's important to understand that like the accreditation laws exist to kind of minimize harm to the public and let people who have money that they can risk basically expose themselves to the risk voluntarily. And not a whole lot of people are, you know, shedding a whole lot of tears that like Henry Kissinger and Betsy DeVos, you know, lost lots of money because they have lots of money to begin with, right? Um, now, what is debated right now is that policymakers on both sides of the aisle in the United States um, are having a debate whether the accreditation laws are necessarily too restrictive and that they shut the public out of these, you know, high risk, high return investments, because those two are always correlated, right? If you want stable index funds, which give a consistent return, like that's a class of investment you can buy in. But if you want something that, you know, may potentially give a hundred X returns, then that involves taking some risk. And that's just part of, part of capitalism, right? Um, on the right, people think that the like, individual choice uh, is paramount and that if the public wants to go invest in high risk investments, that's their choice. Individual liberty is paramount um, and the government shouldn't really dictate your risk taking. Um, it's just, like we said last time, it's kind of just evolution, right? This is just markets doing their thing. Uh, and then on the left, you have kind of the, the perspective is that like, you know, are introducing this artificial gate that basically keeps, you know, the general public, the working public from getting access to these potentially parabolic uh, investments is basically kind of gating the wealth to the already wealthy. And so people like Piketty have written extensive trees on kind of like the consolidation of wealth, uh, growing fast economic output, patrimonial capitalism. And so there's kind of definitely a debate on both sides about like, is the current securities framework fair? Does it necessarily, you know, limit the public's exposure to new, new technologies and exciting new investments? And so just to emphasize here, we're now entering the point where, just to say the, the context is, there is a securities framework, it had certain good reasons for it, crypto in general uh, type stuff has been totally outside that, um, almost sometimes intentionally outside of the regulatory framework is kind of key actually for crypto sort of working. And now we're coming to the steel manning part. You know, is there a good argument to say, hey, actually these frameworks are, are too restrictive and you know, may, you know, maybe you might want somewhere in the middle, but hey, there's something good about being, you know, you know, going for it in this way. And so just to emphasize this is we're coming to the steel manning, the steel man part. And you just summarize two things. One is just individual choice. If like our Wild West discussion last week, if you want to on a right, you might say, hey, people should be able to invest in whatever they want. They lose all their money, they lose all their money and they'll they'll learn or someone who's better will will succeed in their place. And on the left, there's an argument like, hey, you know, okay, there's examples like Theranos where, you know, it, the high net worth got harmed, but we're actually limiting, you know, ordinary people from getting access to these high return opportunities. Do you want to say a bit more about the kind of steel man thesis for a, a more kind of unregulated for the kind of crypto type approach to securities issuance? Yeah, and this important point is that like, uh, with the advent of platforms like Ethereum, uh, it's very, very easy to create kind of an equity crowdfunding structure uh, in which you sell basically tokens as a proxy for equity, a security, um, to the public directly. Uh, instead of basically buying it in dollars and going through like a law firm that sets up a company in Delaware and issues shares, right? You just issue um, basically a vir virtual capital, which is represented in like our contract on the Ethereum blockchain and that lets you raise capital, uh, admittedly denominated in things like Ether, 
uh, which is a cryptocurrency, um, from the public directly without going through the law firm, without going registering with the SEC. Um, you can do it completely anonymously, so you don't have to register at all. Uh, and companies or entities, I'll say, have raised you know billions of dollars equivalent in seed capital for ventures that are extremely early, and you know, they don't have to involve lawyers. They don't have to involve the SEC. They don't have to do, involve the government. They can do it from completely with outside of the regulatory framework and outside of, you know, the law. Um, and for some people, that's, you know, that is an optimal way for them to raise capital. Um, previously, this kind of access was only engaged people with basically connections to large funds in the United States, access to lawyers to set up these structures and access to just the capital that, you know, people in Western countries have. Um, and so the notion is that perhaps this is kind of a liberatory and egalitarian force that's going to democratize early company formation, lower the barriers to company formation, uh, and allow all types of new types of common enterprises that were previously prohibited by law to exist online. Wow. I mean, yeah, it sounds, yeah, and you can feel the energy and it's like this ability, I think, to raise, you're saying this ability to raise capital outside of the rule of law is not only a good thing, it is an outright human right. You know, this is the, the maybe this, the kind of libertarian version of this, if we took it even further, is, yeah, it's a human right to be able to do this, to raise capital in whatever way you see it. And it's a safeguard against tyranny. You know, it's it's the analogy maybe in, in financial capitalism of, Edward Snowden of Sci-Hub of, of, of WikiLeaks. Um, it, and so I kind of, so that's a powerful, it's a powerful vision. Uh, and th there's a sense that maybe equity markets, as you're saying, are ripe for disruption. It is time for the twilight of the Securities Act and the start of a new era that will reconfigure the global economy. Um, and what happens on the other side of this financial configuration can only be better than what we currently have. That's the, I think the, if we kind of put it in the most powerful, clear terms, that's the, the steel man version of this thesis of, hey, no, crypto might be doing something a bit, a bit kind of, a bit cheeky uh, right now, but it's actually this incredible, you know, it's time to clean out the stables. It's time to start again. And they're pioneering the way in that regard. Have, have I kind of captured, is that right, Stephen, the, the, the essence of the steel man thesis for this position of unregulated crypto as unregulated securities are a good thing? Yeah, I mean, that's the strongest case is that like, you know, the Securities Act of 1934 was a reaction to the Great Depression, like, but it was basically meant to prevent, you know, grandma who invested, you know, $10 in a canning company in Oklahoma and got screwed, preventing her from losing her money way back then. But like, we live in the age of the internet, Everything is global. Everything's international. There's clearly a large amount of dry powder floating around, looking for you know new innovative ventures to go into. You know why shouldn't we basically just say you know the Securities Act of 1934 existed in 1934. It doesn't apply now. Basically, the world has become decentralized, and uh, by lowering barriers to company formation, we just basically enter a new, more you know golden age of capitalism. Uh, which all sorts of innovation will flow out of these common ventures. Yeah, more innovative, more democratic. What could be, what, how could we put it better? So what, let's now, we're going to turn to what's the critique of that? So the, what about that thesis? It, what, are, what are the issues with that thesis? So the strongest critique uh, is the fact that historically we've tried this in the 1920s basically before the Securities Act was law, uh, and it ended very, very badly for most people. Um, so before securities were regulated, um, there was basically a complete loss of fair, you know, caveat or like, you know, just buyer beware. Uh, if somebody wants to sell you a security, um, you know, then it's really just between you and the counterparty. There's, there's no government, there's no regulation. Like it's just, you know, capitalism is pure rawest form. And if you've ever seen the movie kind of like There Will Be Blood by Daniel Day-Lewis, you kind of see, you know, the kind of heydays of this kind of, um, the excesses of this era in like the, the late 1900s and like the 1920s, right? Where there was all these kind of fly-by-night charlatans that ran wild selling public to the security. Um, and, even at the time, right, everybody kind of looked at all of the kind of excesses that were going on. And like, there was a kind of fear about like buying these kind of investment contracts. Um, 
because you have no idea if you're ever going to get your money back out of them uh, because there was no framework for figuring these questions out, right? And so quickly after, I mean, after the Great Depression and the kind of the market collapse, which in some sense was actually kind of correlated to the kind of these excesses in, in markets at the time, um, most United States created what were called like blue sky laws, uh, which were uh, state-based laws, which basically are issued to stop the sale of stock and kind of fly by night companies or like imaginary oil wells or like distant gold mines that would promise, you know, amazing wealth or like other kind of fraudulent exploits because that's what people do when there's no regulation, right? And I think right now history is kind of repeating itself because like, you know, the Shibu Inu coins and the Doge coins are basically exactly the same kind of blue sky securities that we saw in the 1920s. And people were attracted to get rich quick schemes back then just as much as they are today. And like human psychology, you know, moves at the pace of a glacier. And so like, there's no reason to believe, well, some, some might argue there's no reason to believe that exactly the same kind of predatory structures issued back in the 1920s are being issued today because they're not regulated as securities. Yes, and this human, and we all know that there is a human propensity in us for the, for the, the get rich, get rich, quick scheme especially when we see some examples of that happening um you know it's like oh something magically did happen it, it, it's very destabilizing i mean we only can look at gold rushes to see that so um kind of point one is that we've tried this before and it didn't go well and there seems an incredible analogy between now and what's got some of the things that are going on now and what went on then i mean as you say no one really who could imagine uh, that what is the, the Shibu Inu or the Dogecoin? It, it has to be a greater fool type setup. You know, like there is nothing other than the belief in it. Um, and at some point one feels that like, uh, what is it? Um, you know, um, right. You think you can, you can suspend gravity for only so long by belief. Um, and that, that, that gravity will bite back. So what, what else is there to say then about what happened a century ago because you say history is repeating itself are there things that we can look at you know maybe it doesn't doesn't repeat but it certainly rhymes what rhymes can we see with history of a, a century ago yeah i think we have to look at kind of what the remedies were to all this fraud uh, because despite all the similarities you know the security firms we put in place um you know the progressive policy is part of the new deal um uh, Basically, we sign into law the Securities Act of 1933, the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, which were all largely large financial reconfigurations of the US economy. Um, and these acts largely cleaned up most of the fraud that led up to the Great Depression. Um, and the US framework is basically the blueprint for securities policy for a great many other countries. And right, yeah. so then after the Great Depression ends, um, the US is victorious in World War II. Um, after we put these laws in place, there's a great peace in financial markets for a very long time. Um, there's a lot of success stories. We've basically completely eliminated bank runs, right? All the bank runs that happened in the Great Depression have not occurred in, in, um, in the United States since then. Um, US capital markets thrived once regulation came in, they became extremely large, robust. There's a new era of unrivaled growth and private innovation, right? People build companies left and right, you know, innovation you know, built, you know, the American powerhouse, economic powerhouse that it is today. And I think among a lot of sort of centrist kind of policymakers, it's the notion that, you know, regulated capital markets taken on the whole of human history generally produce relative prosperity and that putting this you know regulatory framework that kind of limited the excesses a bit basically produce even more prosperity than the kind of laissez-faire complete you know buyer beware markets that we saw before and that prosperity kind of you know lifted all boats yeah so in short um regulated security mark capital markets were kind of good were good for everyone um this you know it, it it taken as a whole looking at the arc of human history uh this produced relative prosperity and it, just if you're a if you're a to some extent whatever way if you're a capitalist they merely made capital markets work really well um uh they provided you know just to be emphasized what this is they provide confidence which actually means people are more willing to put money i think they particularly uh they're also in some ways more egalitarian 
the kind of people who do tend to risk money in the blue sky ventures often tend to be in various ways the most vulnerable people who are most uh you know who, who are willing to bet on a on a risky you know the gold mine in in peru or the latest Dow token but on average our experience of human history is that is a losing proposition just like you can go to a casino and walk out a millionaire you can you can go and pull the right slot machine on average people who play the slot machines lose money and significantly lose money to the casino um so it's been both a force for capitalism it's been a force if you're on the left for a more fairer egalitarian framework that protects uh, the vulnerable and i also want to emphasize here it hasn't prevented the general public participating in financial markets or in very risky investments there are many intermediaries ranging, as we said, from your pension fund to other market intermediaries who provide expertise and who are regulated in important ways by which you can pull your money and invest in risky ventures to some extent, if you wish. Um, but there are key limitations and there are particularly limitations to the, way, the degree to which early stage, highly risky ventures can, do I say target or at least present their offerings directly to retail investors who are um, limited in time, attention and so on. Now, the next point of the critique is just to emphasize here, if I understand, is that crypto, uh, most crypto tokens, most of the things being issued are securities on any reasonable reading of the law is that, I mean, that, that is one point just to emphasize here. According to the SEC, crypto tokens would meet the Howey test in our view. So according to every statement we've seen from the SEC, um, if you were to pick your average token that's being sold on a crypto exchange, it meets the criterion for security, right? And just meeting your, it should just think about your general intuition about these things. If you go approach somebody like in the pub and ask them why they're buying a crypto token, typically they're not giving you this kind of like, you know, cypherpunk kind of, I want to, you know, dismantle the state or something. They're giving you a very clear answer. Like I want to buy this token, buy low, and I want to sell it high. I want to make dollars, right? <laughs> so like basically people are clearly buying these things as investments. Just they would buy like stocks, right? Uh, and that's the situation. Like if you ask the average person about why they're buying these things, they're buying them as an investment. Um, and that investment is in a common venture. Um, these tokens are not, they don't pop into existence randomly. They're a bunch of people <laughs> that basically form either a official company or a unofficial company, which is basically a collective uh, people that basically create the blockchain code and all the software that launches the token, they go off and promote it, they go off and secure the network, and they go off and, you know, basically give people a reason to invest in this thing. Um, and so in that sense, it's not all that different than like an early stage startup. Um, and early stage startups are regulated, there's, you know, the sale of the sale of shares in early stage companies is regulated as securities. So philosophically, there's not a whole lot of reason why these things shouldn't be regulated as securities. Um, except now that the enterprises possibly exist as completely anonymous entities. And that's where the SEC comes in and says, you know, this all looks very strange because like, how do you reconcile the fact that you have to go and register with the SEC before you sell these things with the fact that people are just doing it anyways, right? And so instead of going through law firms and like, um, you know, registration with the government bodies, you know, have like anonymous discord servers with anonymous founders. Um, and this is all being done sort of outside of the regulatory framework. And if you look at things like DAOs, quite literally, um, they are literally created to basically completely resemble voting shares in companies. Because um, some shares, when you buy them, you basically get a certain amount of percentage of vote, which gives you some control of the governance of an entity, right? So DAOs are basically that. Uh, they're basically creating <laughs> a securities you know, framework that basically exists to basically give people voting rights in a common enterprise, right? And the real question, and this is a real, you know, tricky one for like uh, Chairman Gensler at the SEC is like, how do we bring this potentially great mass of like scofflaw unregistered securities within the regulatory perimeter to protect the public um, and basically maintain, you know, what the benefits that they already perceive themselves as having? And is this even possible? Yeah, and I, 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 we want to emphasize again that, or I want to emphasize from our point from our last episode, we say protect the public, you know, maybe the thing is, there's this crucial thing called trust, trust and confidence in 
in in the stock market in or in stocks or in our financial system or in our institutions and if they don't do this well what we have is another diminishment of trust and there's there's this kind of funny thing which is in some degree i would say some of the crypto web 3 or blockchain narrative often runs on a fairly large degree of skepticism or critique of existing um state or other institutions and yet the very thing that's going on has the 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 risks um further degrading our the confidence when thing if things were to go wrong so i think this is a really crucial point and this is a point or a point in time also when it's you know compared even to the 20s it's even easier right to buy whether it's public equities or to buy crypto um this this is the smartphone era is that right yeah i mean like it has never been easier to go buy stocks in public markets the era of like Robin Hood and like zero cost commissions has basically, you know, largely given the public uh, the ability to kind of get exposure to the public markets in ways that we've never seen throughout human history, right? You used to have to be kind of, you know, post a lot of money to like a Schwab account and you'd have to go like pay a commission for a broker. All of that's been kind of brought down in this kind of race to the bottom to give the public maximal access to public markets. So the real question right now, and this is a critique that the crypto people actually have, there's a kernel of truth to what they're claiming, is that there's an interest in giving the public access to private equity investments, right? And then the question we really have to ask is like, okay, that's a cool idea, actually. Um, could we actually figure out a way to give people who are like, you know, your average on the pop um, retail trade access to these, you know, admittedly high risk, high return investments if they want it. Uh, and this is largely like a, like a legal question. Can we figure out the kind of right structure that kind of balances the interests of all the parties? Like the entrepreneurs want to raise capital and obviously the mom and pop investors just want to get a return, right? And so the reason that these private equity investments are kind of gated at the moment um, is two reasons. There's a horizon and a liquidity concern. So the horizon is the fact that when you invest in like two guys in a garage, right, typically you're not going to see your money back until um, a very, very long period, basically when the, the company is going to go public eventually, or if they have an acquisition. So investing in early ventures often has like a horizon of like 10 years, right? Uh, so that's really great if you're like a family office or a pension fund, because that's the kind of timeframes that you plan on, but people live their lives, you know, they have... They have kids, you know, they have like life events, they need to potentially withdraw their money, right? And so the problem with private equity investments is that they're illiquid, right? You can't get your money out until there's some sort of liquidity event, right? Now that's fine for venture capital funds because that's how they're built as investment vehicles. They take long-term positions in high risk, high return investments, and they do a lot of them, right? Uh, and the people investing in the VC fund, basically they're called LPs, are fine with the kind of horizon liquidity concerns because they're diversified in a bunch of other investments. So if they need their money quickly, they don't pull them out of the VC fund, they pull them out of other investments, right? So it's really challenging for people who are gonna write necessarily small checks um, into this kind of investment vehicle that would give the public access to private equity um, to factor those into their kind of investment thesis because the investment thesis of like pension funds versus retail investors is just necessarily different because there are different types of people involved, right? And then as an entrepreneur, um, you're setting up a cap table, which basically allocates your shares to a certain number of people. And just you as an entrepreneur, you don't necessarily want like 2000 kind of, you know, the, the comments like retired janitors of Idaho writing $500 checks into your company because you have a legal overhead for every single shareholder to basically maintain, you know, communications with them, do disclosures, to basically, you know, present the the financials of the company on a periodic basis. And if you have twenty thousand people writing five hundred dollar checks, the overhead on compliance costs for you as an entrepreneur is is really crazy, right? So you want some way to pool this money in an investment vehicle that you know gives people exposure to these things where they can withdraw their money when they want, on whatever horizon they want. Um, and it actually accommodates people writing small checks into it. And that's a really hard problem to do under our current framework. Um, and so it's actually kind of a valid criticism that like there's not currently a structure that exists to do this because it's a really genuinely hard problem in markets. You, we got, so we got to summarize. So first of all, why from a social position would we want to do it? And what we just said is there are large 
there are that there you know is there a problem today is there a lack of capital because i mean just to say to, to solve some of the problems in crypto what's happening is there's almost like an early stage ipo it's like from the very beginning it's not like money's even locked up it's like it's tradable on well there are this tradable on exchange or it's least tradable with other people very early and often on exchange very early um what the question does this provide capital that wouldn't otherwise be there for innovative enterprise that's why we want capital markets we you know in a way and what are the what are the risks because the risk here i even want to come to is just the failure there is a high risk high return tax mentality but that it, it, is that actually even the case the level of failure here seems very other than the bubble aspect it does seem the failure rate is very high and therefore like, is it, it may, this may not even be allocating capital wisely, let alone the inequity questions of allowing unsophisticated real estate investors to kind of be sold on the latest kind of modern day equivalent of the, the gold mine in the, per, in, in the Peruvian Andes that you've never seen. Um, what, I mean, what is the, the failure rate at the moment for these kind of investments? I mean, that goes to Or the, even for question, venture. Like that goes to the deeper question is like, even if we could construct this kind of investment vehicle, is it even desirable? Because if you just look at even just normal startups, the failure rate on these things is absurdly high. It's like a 95%, most startups fail, right? Um, and that's just the nature of, that's not even detached from the investments themselves. It's just attached to the fact that most early companies just fail. Um, and so if you're a retail investor just looking for like stable returns, which any rational investor should be doing, then, you know, venture is not necessarily a great asset class for you. You're probably better off just putting your money in like index funds or some broad spectrum product, right? Um, and so like, you're right. If we lower the barriers to entry on these things, we let basically entrepreneurs do what's basically the equivalent of like an IPO from the start, right? So instead of waiting 10 years for you to have a company with like lots of us attraction and customers and you know revenue uh, basically was saying well you can just go immediately offer to the public um, and we have a case study in this from recent history which is kind of the ICO bubble that happened in the kind of 2016 2017 era and even taken in comparison to the normal startup market the failure rate there uh, is even higher than normal startups right we saw unprecedented levels of failures like that we haven't seen since markets in like the 1920s like it's even worse than the kind of the gold mine in peru that nobody's ever seen because now they're talking about like you know we're going to build this you know utopia in the metaverse that's going to you know create this kind of financial perpetual motion machine which is going to spew infinite money right um and so just it's a kind of moral hazard that kind of creates a condition for fraud on these things um, and giving seed stage ventures billions of dollars in seed capital completely detached from revenue traction or product market fit is kind of a recipe for disaster for two reasons. Um, there's a perverse incentive to basically just abscond with the seed money, right? Basically just run off with your investor money, uh, not actually build anything, right? Or uh, to basically create what are the equivalent of like technical Potemkin villages Basically, the company exists, but it doesn't really go to market. It basically just pays out um, a bunch of internal people from the investment without actually building anything. And so with crypto tokens, that's particularly perverse because since the thing is basically doing the equivalent of an IPO <laughs> initially, right, the company can basically just focus on like maximizing the value of its stock or its token, right, which admittedly is what some public companies like to do. It's like the Friedman stock, right? Except if you basically start a company off on this accelerated version of the Friedman doctrine, in which the only purpose of the early venture is to basically make the token go up, right? They're never going to launch a product because the stock is the product, right? And so we see this all the time in the space because, um, you know, I have a fairly deep background in in like computer science and technical um, aspects of of, you know, technology these days. Uh, and people who have degrees in economics can read these white papers that present a prospectus. And we have no idea what these things are doing. Uh, these companies basically have, you know, billions of dollars in seed capital completely detached from a product that seems completely absurd. And how is the lay public 
going to look at these white papers that require, you know, PhDs in economics or computer science to even parse and figure out whether this is a good investment or not? And the answer is generally they're not going to. They're just going to either blindly invest the money or not blindly invest the money. And this entire structure is rather fraught with moral hazard. And it's not clear that this is going to create a environment in which entrepreneurship can thrive. It's going to create an environment in which fraud can thrive. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just just to say also, it's I think it's just as examples to think about. It's very rare in any other area that sort of at IPO or coin listing. I mean, some coins fall 90, 90, 99 percent, 95. I mean, they, you know, that there are coins even in the last few months that have fallen over 99 percent from there. <laughs> you know, it, 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 that that's not normally when a company might things might not go well when they IPO or something like that and they'll be down 20 30 percent at bet you know like and they they have real revenue they have other things we can examine um so to kind of conclude it, it seems like the same things that the question would be like wow let's try out unregulated securities and what we're seeing is we're doing an experiment in a way almost right now and very similar things at the moment to what happened in the 1920s are happening so it isn't seeming leading to like, wow, these incredible new things are getting funded that otherwise wouldn't get funded or would instead, it is leading to uh, retail investors having access to highly unregulated products that may well, so far on the evidence, often not turn out well. I mean, I think there was, a, we can put citation, there'll be citation in the post from this, but I think there's a recent paper, which is confirmed, you know, even confirmed, you know, looking at the returns on uh, ICOs and on other recent investments. Um, also comparing retail investors versus insiders and seeing that there's this kind of differential where retail investors end up worse off. Um, obviously, the underlying question, and the, the underlying question would be also, is there evidence that we don't have enough money going into innovation uh, in these areas? Is there a lack? I mean, I, that's not what we're answering this question, but that'd be the fundamental social question is, do we, is the risk, which is that some people, that there are these kind of uh, problems that we know of the moral hazard, the, the the sort of ripping off of unsophisticated investors that then diminish trust in the system, that diminish uh, confidence in our capital markets. Is there a is there something which is worth that risk? And you know we want to be innovative, we want to question our uh, our assumption, but there seem to be some really good reasons why we created at least some of the regulation we had. Um, but it brings us to I guess our constructive question: Is is there if one was interested in ways that balance the risk of retail investors for their desire for access to high risk early ventures, is there something that would do that? Um, at, or uh, should we simply bracket these kind of security sales so the maybe already wealthy, I'd like to say, or the already sophisticated, you can invest in uh, funds as a retail investor that then will go out and invest in risky or VC or venture capital type investments. Um, so Stephen, do you wanna say something to that? I mean, it's, it's a really important question. I think a lot of smart people I know are kind of on both sides of this issue because it's really important to be to actually be having because it's like, oh, could we modify the law so that maybe there's a more efficient version of them that could exist, right? And the thing about like, you know, existing funds is that like the sophistication comes from the fact that a bunch of people who are willing to accept a bunch of risk go pool their money and that fund goes off and hires a bunch of people to do rigorous due diligence on the investment on the venture, right? And they can do the research and hire the PhDs to kind of dig into these products, right? Um, and, you know, that process exists and it kind of creates an environment in which a lot of innovation does occur. And obviously the fact that there's a lot of just dry powder in the United States, like chasing after innovation, it has one of the most dynamic, um, you know, and versatile kind of innovation economies on the planet, right? Simply because we kind of stumbled upon empirically this kind of Goldilocks zone of this kind of practical, regulatory, legal, public interest concerns. And that gives rise to the kind of investor accreditation laws that we have today, the kind of existing in fields that are allowed under the law. Now, I think it's a fair question to ask, like where should the accredited investor red line actually be? Maybe it's too high, maybe it's too low, maybe it's just right. Um, and I think on the back of that is setting that bar slightly higher is simply kind of a reaction to the fact that the courts, the people who are going to arbitrate, you know, whether an investment was a fraud or not, uh, can only, you know, scale so much, right? Because um, 
the wheels of justice grind very slow, right? And so, you know, if all the public's money is kind of locked up in these, you know, potentially high risk investments and a certain percentage of them are going to be fraud, um, the public needs to have some legal recourse by which they could potentially recover some of these funds because that's just how justice works, right? Um, and can the courts actually scale to handle millions of new investment fraud cases every year? If you basically just say to you, it's open season on, you know, it's the twilight of the Securities Act and like everything can basically just be, you know, addressable by the public. Can the courts actually handle that? Um, and then the question is, well, okay, maybe they can't handle it, but maybe just like extreme levels of fraud or simply the price we have to pay for a more dynamic economy. Um, and maybe it doesn't, maybe that's the best thing for the, that is to a new idealized form of our system that actually works better than what we have today. Or maybe it leads to ruin like it has in the past. And if we kind of go back to this kind of evolution metaphor, like, you know, there are certain animals that are just adapted to survive in really, really extreme environments, right? And who's to say that your average kind of retail investor wouldn't kind of adapt to be kind of an extremophile in a world in which there's no regulation you know, we have a complete unregulated hyper capitalist system and there's no recourse at all to the state when things go badly. And there's, you know, their investor extremes maybe bold as that kind in the future. That puts it very well. And I mean, we're now coming to our kind of summary of our thesis. So let's just recap uh, for, for those of you here on the, on the call uh, with us. One, what we're saying here in this, in our outline is first, what are securities? Why does it matter? So securities have this long history, uh, stock shares, bonds, et cetera, and they have become regulated over time uh, for very good reason that we're gonna talk more about. Number, we talked at length about. Number two, um, if you look at most crypto, uh, investments or crypto tokens, they would meet the test of being securities. Uh, so securities ideas, security regulation is very relevant to crypto. Something we really talk about. And in particular, if crypto were regulated as uh, securities, this would be a big problem because most of the source of capital, which drives the sort of number goes up aspect of the system comes from the fact that you can have a load of money coming from unsophisticated investors into the system. If that were to stop, if there were greater regulation and transparency, a lot of things would break down, is the suggestion, or at least it would certainly create a great slowing. Uh, at the present, as we've said, crypto tokens are operating largely outside the securities framework, even though there have been legal and other decisions that suggest they would be regulated this way, they haven't, it hasn't really been formally made clear. Uh, there are good reasons although there are reasons, to, as we'll say, to critique it, why securities have heavily regulated, in particular, investing in early stage, high risky ventures, which is what most uh, crypto projects at their best are, <laughs> uh, is often limited, uh, often highly regulated to people with a lot of money or a lot of sophistication or both. As we emphasize, it doesn't mean that the general public is excluded from investing in those ventures, that they normally have to do it through an intermediary, so maybe a fund or some other entity that has sophistication and the maybe diversification to deal with the, the risk involved. Um, in particular, crypto almost puts kind of early stage uh, investing and early stage kind of equity crowdfunding on steroids. It makes it incredibly easy and incredibly quick to essentially build an equity crowdfunding platform. It's almost like kind of what Ethereum is almost built to do. You can start a DAO tomorrow with voting shares and shares, et cetera, and set it up without any regulation, as it were, at the get-go. Now, as we said, the best argument we can say is that, hey, um, laws are outdated. They've got a bit rusty. They've got a bit over-restrictive. The state has got too involved. as this want to happen in bureaucratic states. And this is the twilight of the Securities Act. It's time to throw out this restrictive stuff and enter in a new area of libertarian, democratic financial capitalism where anyone can invest in whatever they want, whenever they want, in whatever they way they want. And that will both be good for innovation and it will be good for allowing it, the general public into these high, uh, high, high risk, uh, high reward investments, which in the long run, maybe they are better. Maybe they do give a better high risk, high reward, better reward risk ratio than other things. Although the evidence isn't with that as we'll come to. The critique of this is simply, we have tried this several times before. It's never gone well. There are systemic reasons not to do with technology regarding human psychology, 
uh, and the complexity of investments of why they don't go well. Uh, many of the things that are happening right now seem very similar to what happened in the 1920s, for example, and led to obviously not only the Great Depression, but also a significant breakdown, maybe in trust and confidence um, and so on. And there's the evidence that the Securities Act that were enacted, the laws that were put in place, uh, led to the kind of great peace, a long period of prosperity, relatively uh, quiet time in financial markets, but one in which a lot of capital flowed in, was well allocated, led to overall prosperity. Um, overall, also, it seems pretty clear that crypto tokens do meet the Harry test, and the SEC has the unenviable role at the moment of dealing with how they bring these unregulated securities within the, the perimeter of regulation. Um, or of letting them stay outside, but then almost certainly being blamed if things go wrong uh, by both politicians on both sides of the aisle, uh, but certainly also the general public. Um, the one interesting question that we can end with is, is it desirable and what are the criteria, and we're not saying we answer them, what are the criteria by which one would alter or evolve our regulations to allow more access to high risk uh, early stage investments? Are there a different set of balances that we could find which allowed more access, but also protected people from exploitation and uh, being uh, taken advantage of, or either because they're foolish or simply they don't understand the risks involved? Um, what should we do in that regard? Uh, that's a really good question to ask. And it's one that we leave our audience with, and we'd love to have comments in the thread on YouTube or on, uh, uh, or on the, uh, the podcast. Uh, and I want to leave you finally with Stephen, if there's anything you want to add just at the end of our summary before we sign off. I think that's a really great summary of the entire arguments and the pros and cons. I think this all goes back to like one single question, which is like, what is the right interplay between investment risk and the rule of law? And under the Silicon Valley model, it's created destruction by any extra legal means, actually a positive force for both capitalism and the world. And that's a profound question I think lies at the heart of this debate itself. Absolutely, although I will just say it assumes that the capital is channeled into the right area. If, for example, tomorrow people are persuaded to spend lots of money digging gold mines on the moon that turn out to be totally made up or just hugely inefficient, it will have diverted large amounts of capital, not into creative destruction, but into creative waste in that regard. So it's really important to emphasize that at the end. So, well, to sign off, you can follow, we, Stephen and I and others are really part of a large project now we're developing around examining uh, constructively and rigorously, but also open-mindedly and critically, the phenomenon of crypto and Web3, which this series is part. We also have interviews with others uh, who have different positions, different perspectives. And as you said, you can follow it at lifeitself.us slash web3 or soon to arrive web3.lifeitself.us. You can follow Stephen on Twitter at twitter.com slash smdl. And you can find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash for life itself or twitter.com slash Rufus Pollock. And we look forward to you tuning in for our next episode next week uh, on a topic to be determined. All the best until next time.